Hello and thank you for joining us on Newsweek, where we highlight some of the biggest stories that made the headlines recently. I am Jacinta Obiuku. This week, the court of appeal in Abuja quashed the terrorism charge the federal government preferred against the detained leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Ipop Namdi Kano. Also this week, the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, suspended its eight-month-old strike conditionally after its National Executive Committee marathon meeting, which started from Thursday night to the early hours of Friday. Later on the show, we will take a look at why more than two million registered voters will not be able to vote in the 2023 elections. All the details in a moment. Stay with us. Well, the Court of Appeal in Abuja on Thursday quashed the terrorism charge the federal government preferred against the detained leader of the indigenous people of Biafra, Ipop, Namde Kano. But in a swift reaction, the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Ababa Kamalami, argued that the court only discharged Kano and did not acquit him. Now joining me via Zoom, I have lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria, Chino Biago. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. All right. Now, let's make us understand this. Namdi Kano is discharged but not acquitted. What do you make of this judgment? Are you there, Mr. Ubiago? Yes, I'm here, but I can't hear you. Okay, I'll repeat my question. Abak said if he was acquitted, if he was discharged and not acquitted, can you tell us uh, what you make of this whole judgment? Well, I've not seen a copy of the judgment of the court to know whether he was whether the judgment, the court, the, 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 the justices of the Court of Appeals said um, he was discharged or acquitted, or uh, that the rendition was set aside. Um, the, I've, I've not read the judgment to know what the consequential order is, but from the reports we're getting, if it is discharged, of course, discharge is not an acquittal. You know, uh, discharge means the charge can be brought back. But it's not a it is not a dismissal on merit. Uh, but if he's decided and acquitted, then it is on merit, and he cannot be charged for the same offense. But remember that what is that court of appeal was a matter of rendition and not validity of the charge. All right. In what ways do you think this case can possibly affect the 2023 elections? Well, I think the government should take a political solution. Uh, because the court had already spoken loudly that the rendition was illegal. And therefore, if the foundation is illegal, then anything that, that's placed on that foundation is illegal. You cannot place uh, something on nothing and expect it to stand. So all the trials going on based on that rendition are illegal, and the court has said so. And government had earlier said that they will wait and obey the decision of the court. So if the court of appeal in Abuja has given a decision, the government should not hesitate to carry out the decision, release him, and if they have another charge, they can bring it back. But the proper thing to be done is to release uh, the defendant because the court has said the process that brought him to trial is faulted, is illegal. There's no other argument about that. If the government has, if the attorney general or the prosecutor has any other charge against him, he's free to bring it back, but not on this particular instance to disobey the decision of the court. All right, before I let you go, let me ask you this last question. Do you also think Namdi Kano's eventual release will help calm the tensions in the Southeast as the 2023 election draw closer? Of course it will. You know, it's an executive issue that will affect the elections, and I think the government needs to take note of that. And in order to create an, a better atmosphere for a peaceful election, Nandi Kalu should be released. That should ease the tension in the polity and allow peace to reign towards the election. 
All right. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, lawyer and senior advocate of Nigeria, Chinno Ubiago. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Newsweek continues in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back, and it's still Newsweek, where we discuss the biggest stories that made the headlines in the week. Now, universities across the country are set to come alive eight months after the Academic Staff Union of Universities embarked on an industrial strike, a strike action. This is as members of the ASO in various universities have expressed willingness to comply with the directive of the national body with immediate. led to its eight months old strike. Well, joining me in the studio, I have political analyst Kali Jaipur. Welcome to the yeah. show. Good evening, viewers. All right. Now, some are of the opinion that ASU shouldn't have called or suspended the strike in the first place, especially um, as regards to the fact that they are demands or what they are demanding for are uh, yet to be met. What do you think? Well, to my mind, I think that uh, it was quite reasonable for ASU to have called off the strike. One, ASU was on trial. They are teachers of the law. They teach the law. And the whole world was quite waiting. Nigerians are waiting to see whether they were going to obey or disobey the court order. So if they disobeyed, it would have gone on record that they cannot put to practice what they teach. If they also disobey, 
It's also going to put ASU in a web. What do I mean by a web? Already, there are threats, there are internet threats. The federal government seems to be smarter in the game. They were on the verge of breaking the ASU rank and file. The Minister of Labor has announced the registration of two new alternate uh, ASU. So that is, of course, is on the brinks. So it's either ASU calls up the strike or they are faced with two options. One, they are going to be facing an internal crisis, which, of course, could also nose ball into the entire collapse of ASU. It could be a temporary collapse. It's happened to ASU before, but then ASU bounced back. But then the third option, while I think it's reasonable for them to have called off the strike, is to also say that those who fight to, who fight to, to, who runs to fight will live to fight another day. You can't win all of your battles at the same time. Yes, ASU may not have won the entirety of the struggle now. It does not mean that the struggle is over. After all, it's a temporary call of strike. But I also think that the fourth option, the fourth leg of why I think it's reasonable for them to have called off the strike, to say that there are well-meaning well Nigerians who have called for ASU to show understanding. Then, as they were calling on ASU, they were calling on federal government. So it takes two to tango. But at the end of the day, uh, somebody's must blink first. So if ASU blinked, it does not mean the final blink. So for me, it was quite reasonable. All right. Speaking of the federal government, do you think they can be trusted to meet as a strike um, demand, rather? <laughs> well, who can be trusted? We're in a situation where you cannot trust me, I cannot trust you. So I cannot vouch that, as, that federal government can be trusted. But don't forget that federal government has also expressed its unwillingness to be able to meet up the ASU demands. Federal government is saying the economy is nose diving. The resources are not there. So what they're asking for to the federal government is beyond the federal government's capability to pay. So they had expressed that. So if they have called off the strike to say that whether ASU will be, uh, federal government will be trusted or not, it's to be asking for the obvious. For me, it's not about trusting the federal government. It's about, one, the availability of the resources. Beyond the availability of the resources, is to also to say that government feels that there are other, other demands of the economy. Apart from teachers making demands, the health sector is there, the political sector is there, election is around the corner, and of course, Naira is not picking up. Naira keeps diving, nose diving every day. We are so, you know, import dependent. We are not exporting nothing. So how do you expect your economy to grow? So it's all about all of us. It's about those of us also who will import anything importable. It's about those of us who have abandoned, there is insecurity. People abandon the farm. So, so many things are plaguing the society, but all the same, I will wish and ask, you know, plead with federal government to say that now that Hasu has called off the strike, it's incumbent on federal government to accede reasonably to a greater extent to the demand of ASU. They, the, they are the builders of our nation, and we cannot afford to allow institutions. So people have been there accusing the federal government to say that some of us keep our children outside the country, so we can afford to shut down the university system. So we must conscientize ourselves as government and as a people to do the bidding of the, the teachers. All right, finally on this topic, uh, many have called for autonomy of this university, for the, this uh, university. Do you think that's desirable at this time? Well, those calling for autonomy is either, is neither here nor there. You want autonomy. Yes, you can have autonomy. Can you fund yourself? To talk about autonomy is to talk about going back to the entire restructure of the university system. And what do I mean by restructuring the entire university system? You have to, one, visit the admission policy. You have to visit the, 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 the whether governments still want to see university education as a social service or as an economic service. Then university education will become an economic service, no longer going to be a social service. It's going to be for those who can afford it. Because university must be ready to charge you know, economic uh, uh, values. So if they charge economic values, how many Nigerians, the poor masses, can afford to pay economic value? 
So if they cannot pay economic value, federal government's responsibility as a, as a government to ensure that the citizens are educated and have university education will have suffered. So government will not want to suffer, and in that wise, government will still want to continue to fund the university. As long as government continues to fund the university, where lies the autonomy? Though whoever pays the piper dictates the tune. So if government continues to fund the university education, and you are saying that you want autonomy, you want to be able to decide what you want, then you must be able to pay your salaries by yourself and your wages. So if you cannot do that, autonomy is like omnibus. It's hanging in the air. It's neither here nor there. So if you have to call for autonomy of the university, we have to start from the scratch. And I say you have to visit the admission policy. Then beyond all of those ones, you can't continue to put everybody in university. I also know that, yes, because we are a developing nation, we must continue to subsidize university education. But I also know that even in the developed world, university education is not free. Mm -hmm. But then, we can't compare ourselves with them because they have developed their economy to a certain level. Mm -hmm. So they can afford not to fund university education. But here, and of course, the level of poverty here is prevalent, is endemic. It's, it's, it's quite pitiable that people cannot afford to even have three square meals a day. So those who cannot afford that, does it mean that the poor man, the, the children of the poor people will not go to, they will not have university education? So it's a mix of apple and oranges. So it's, it's going to be something that is an equivalent task for government and for those who call for autonomy. So for me, I think the, the call for autonomy is not ripe enough. All right. Thank you so much for, so far. Uh, let's go to our last story for tonight. Uh, the Independent National Electric Commission on Tuesday said it, it detected 2.7 million cases of double registration carried out during the last continuous voter registration and that the affected persons have been deleted from the voter register. I still have with me in the studio political analyst Kalijayi Poor. Okay, so 2.7 million in ineligible registrants deleted due to double registration and all of that. Who do you think should be blamed for this? Who should be blamed? I blame the, the, the both parties. The INEC, and I'll tell you why I need to blame them, and then the people. I blame the INEC because the law says continuous voters registration. It means that the portal of INEC must be open all year round. So people, there can be entry, there can be exit. But the question to ask is, as long as you're going to time when you open the register and you give a window for people to register within that framework, there will be mass registration. There will be mass struggles. And therefore, it's not going to be easy for you to, to ensure that people can register at the right time. Secondly, is to also to say that INEC also have done his own beats by way of ensuring that they open the registration. But then where lies the fault of the citizens? The citizens, because of the anxiety, the eagerness, the need for them to exercise their political franchise, all rush into wanting to register. Mm. But then, if they are aware that double registration will mean cancellation, they may not have obtained double registration. Some of them registered double because of ignorance. I challenge INEC that INEC Political Education Unit did a fairly good job this time around. We must commend them. But then, it's not yet enough. Mm. So there must be continuous voters' education. And if we have continuous voters' education, there must be jingle on radio. There must be on television. There must be on newspaper to educate the people more about your civic responsibilities and where you can endanger your civic responsibilities. The people were not educated enough to know the danger. Some also register, like I said, out of ignorance. Some felt that, OK, they were living somewhere before. They need to register a new place. But then they didn't undergo the necessary procedures. They did not undergo the nurses procedure. And some were doing it out of double mind. Some were registered, for instance, maybe they were registered in the East, and they now feel that, oh, I'm in Lagos. 
I need to register in Lagos. Yeah, you can't do that. The laws are there that you can change. But then there must be a submission. You must identify that you have, it's a fact that people have hidden. That's why we're in the trouble today. They ask you when you go there, have you registered before? If you say you have registered, they will ask you to show us proof of your registration. And sometimes, when you cannot even show proof, INEC has been able to, they, they have really tried as a participant in the registration exercise and as a political analyst, as a politician myself, I also took part in the entire exercise and I monitored and I, 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 I can give some kudos to INEC, particularly in my own local government in Nigeria, me fellow do. I, I, I give kudos to the INEC because I was always there, I was always monitoring to see. They did a, a feel good job. At even the, the last hours, they, they were also challenged by resources in terms of enough computers to be able to register as many people as possible. So there were a lot of large crowds. Especially Nigerians also will, must also understand that we must not wait for the last minute. Mm -hmm. We're always waiting for the last minute of everything. They say uh, your, your, you register your, 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 your number on your telephone number, mm -hmm. the identification number. People will not do it until the last minute. So we are last minute people. Mm -hmm. And so we must change that culture, the culture of last minute. It doesn't help us. It makes us do things wrongly, abnormally, and sometimes illegally. So for me, the blame is on both sides, both on the part of the INEC, on the part of the people, and the part of all of us. All right, before we, we're almost out of time, but I want you to briefly tell me, how would you rate INEC's preparation towards the uh, <laughs> upcoming election? How would you rate their performance preparation? <laughs> Well, I won't score them badly. Mm -hmm. I would say they are trying because uh, we must commend them. INEC has moved steps ahead beyond what it used to be. Every election they have continuously improved. And we hope that, well, they have improved. People are saying that maybe they improved because they were, they were, they were isolated elections. Mm -hmm. They were not general elections. For instance, the election in Oshun, the election in Ikiti, that maybe because there were very few states that were involved, they could deploy all their resources and all efforts, and then you can see credible results. But then now we are moving to the ocean, to the sea, to the entire country, going to a general election where every state will be involved. Every local government, every world will be involved. It's, it's very equilibrium. So. It's going to be a major test. Now that they're also using the beavers, which of course they have experimented in some of the isolated states where the elections have been conducted. But now that it's going to be the entire nation, they really to need to double their efforts. They need to cross the teeth, uh, you know, and dot the eyes. It's very important for us to have a credible election. And you want to know that election is the bedrock of democracy. Any country that cannot transit mm -hmm. from one one, one election to another okay. successfully has not really perfected democracy. So the entire world is looking up to INEC, right. and I hope that they will live up to the bidding of the people. All right. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Uh, political analyst Kali Jaipo, thank you. We truly appreciate your time. Thank you very much, and good evening, viewers. Right. Thank you also for being part of the show. And that's our show for today. Remember, you can follow the conversation on our social media platform at TVC News NG or on our website at tvcnews.tv. I am Jacinta Obiuku. Until next week, it's goodbye. <music>